Welcome to Are We There Yet? I'm Katie Gossett. And when babies are born, they're fascinated by the world. As they get older, they want to go out and try things, experience life. Sometimes, maybe before they're quite ready. It's probably one of my biggest fears as a parent how easy it is for kids to access it. It's all pervasive and I just assume they have seen plenty. Seen plenty of what exactly? Well, in this episode we're talking about pornography, or at least we're going to try and talk about it because it seems that it's not always that easy. I've had that kind of conversation, but you know, they just go, I don't want to hear that from you. <laughs> so those conversations are very short and very in, it's very much in passing. I haven't really talked to the girls yet, and that's why it's hard. I mean, you know, I've got a 10-year-old. Why, why the heck am I suddenly, and why is our generation having to talk to 10-year-olds about pornography? They're 10. They should still be playing with Barbie, seriously, <laughs> you know. And yet, here's our clinical psychologist, Catherine Gallagher, who says, actually, we really do need to start talking. My main message to you is at least have these conversations with your kids. They're going to be traversing this issue as they develop. And so to leave it to them to sort it out for themselves might be a really risky strategy. A baby's life begins at the miraculous moment of conception, when one tiny sperm from the husband unites with a mature egg cell deep inside the mother's body. Of course, information about sex has always been out there, and a lot of kids will already know the basics. After all, most of us will have bumbled through the birds and the bees conversation, hopefully less clinically than that excerpt from 1971. But Catherine Gallagher says pornography needs to be part of that chat. These discussions around pornography need to sit within the broader conversations around sex and positive sexuality rather than being a topic in isolation, as this can help children see where your values come from and can give them some anchor points to form their own opinions from. But when it comes to those values, we don't want to present them too rigidly. So to just go, porn is wrong, full stop, end of story, OK, you can feel better about yourself, but why? If I have such a strong emotional response to why porn is wrong or porn is right, then... As a child, remember our kids know us pretty well, I'm knowing that's not a conversation to start up because <laughs> it's a statement. Whereas if the issue is brought up to me in a, this stuff seems to be around a lot, hey? You know, have you got some questions around it? I've certainly got some questions around it. Shall we do some thinking and some talking around this stuff together, even though it might make us feel a bit uncomfortable? That's a very different entrance or warm-up to a conversation. And kids are probably then going to think, even though I don't want to talk about it now, if I ever do want to talk about it, then I know there's an in there. So when your kids are young, you can block pornography on devices or set up parental controls, but really that's only half of the equation. It's about the relationship you have with your kids and your capacity to have bigger conversations with them. A little bit of access to porn is not likely to damage your child, but if we panic about it and overreact, we can actually put our children off coming to us with questions or problems and that might cause some challenges for them. Because they are going to come across it in one form or another. Nudes frighten me. The whole aspect of kids encouraging other kids to take nude photos of themselves and they send it to all their friends and they laugh at it. You know, like I have drummed into my children, you know, you don't ask people for those kind of things. If someone sends you something, you don't distribute it to somebody else. And yet my 13-year-old son sent a nude photo he was sent to one friend and trying to get that technicality through to our kids that you're distributing child porn. That's what you're doing when you send a nude photo. And you can be prosecuted for that at 14. These concerns about today's pornography would likely have been shared by Patricia Bartlett, a former nun. Now, she became a household name here in New Zealand back in the 1970s when she formed the Society for the Promotion of Community Standards. Here she is being interviewed in 1979. You have a vision of a society free of pornography. You've said that things are going to get worse. How would you see it if it got better? Well, I would see these R18 publications not in, in circulation. Frankly, I can't see why men have to have magazines of naked women or bare-top women. To me, I know, I'm well aware that the sex drive in men is very strong. God has given it. The human race must, would not survive without it. But this is a relatively new thing in society, these kind of magazines. 
But although the availability of pornography in magazines was challenging for some in Patricia Bartlett's school of thought back then, the access to it now is a whole new challenge. The sexual contact that's shown in porn can be really worrying because it's sometimes, maybe, not about two consenting adults, um, you know, having a loving relationship. It's often aggressive, it's often um, negating the issue of consent, it's often showing sexual acts that are in the extreme and what they're portrayed as as being the normal. So that's the kind of stuff we can, can get really confused about the messages. So that's where we need to come in and help them make sense of what they've seen. You know real women don't look like that, don't act like that. And, you know, this really unrealistic. You know, these are people playing parts, playing roles. And, yeah. How do they respond? Oh, yeah, of course I know that. You know, the whole, the whole reaction is like, mum, you know. One conversation I've had with my son more than once, and he rolls his eyes and does all those things, but I know he's taken us on board. I said, porn isn't real. It's not how romantic, loving partners necessarily always have, you know, no girl wants to be strangled while she's having sex. And by broaching these uncomfortable topics, we might help them have better relationships in the future. I would be very distraught if I thought either of my sons was being controlling or denigrating a woman or seeing them as just a sexual thing. But I think it's also what you see, and my husband and I, there is a respect in the way that he treats me and that I treat him. I look at it from that aspect of my son, who I want to be a responsible, loving, caring partner when he is one, eventually. I really hope he's not now. Um, <laughs> and I look at my daughters and I think of how I want the boys to treat them when they get into these relationships. And then there's the issue of body image, which we've touched upon in some previous episodes, because pornography, with all its unrealistic bodies, can have an impact there too, on both genders. There's all those questions at times, for instance, are they normal, you know, like um, penis size and all the rest of it. So that wasn't necessarily to me, but, you know, that was to my husband. To what they came to your husband to inquire if their penises were the right sizes? Yeah. Well, they see things and, and then they go, what's normal kind of stuff? Right at the start of this episode, we brought up the question around when we should talk to kids about sex. The pervasiveness and the availability of pornography through social media and online probably actually mean that we should do it sooner than we'd like because a lot of parents tend to hold off until their children are older. I actually think that's a bit risky these days, as children are often developing their beliefs around this stuff from an early age, and so gaps in knowledge can be filled from other sources. A lot of people would describe that they're getting their sex education from, from pornography, and that's a real concern. This doesn't mean we have to be an expert, but if you have gaps, try and be active about filling them, or support your children's learning in the spaces such as school or online, because there are really helpful online ways to learn around this stuff. TED Talks, NetSafe, those kinds of places are good resources to be able to use and, and start up conversations. But what it means is that for a little kid, we're talking about how to be in healthy relationships. We're talking about safe touch. We're talking about how to know their own bodies and how to feel that those bodies are respected and that they need to respect other people's bodies. Now, that's actually sex education. <laughs> You know, we might not be talking about who puts what where, but actually we want people to learn about positive sexuality, sexual development. Trouble is, when our kids have their cringe radar on high alert, how do we go about bringing it up? It might be driving where you're not making eye contact. It might be saying, I've got something I need to say. If you're watching a programme and there's some content on there that's a little bit unsettling or, or about this stuff, a good in to say, hey, what do you reckon about that? I noticed the dad reacted like that. Gosh, is that sometimes something you might worry about me doing if you were to bring that stuff up with me? You know, it's, it's using those ins. I mean, my kids hate when I've gone to a talk about pornography or whatever because they know I'll come home and want to talk to them about stuff. <laughs> oh, mum! But, you know, I, I've learned that it's kind of one or two things that I can kind of get under the radar before they go, oh, whatever! So if it's about pornography, it would be about pornography isn't an accurate representation of what a loving relationship looks like. Sex shouldn't hurt. If it doesn't feel comfortable, then it's okay not to do it. 
if you watch a lot of pornography, it's probably going to affect how you have sex when you're older. It won't make it as fun, or it might create some difficulties for you. Think on that. Then run away and scurry behind the, you know, into the pantry. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. You know, because I think that even while they're saying, whatever, go away, that's disgusting, they're listening. And really what Catherine is saying is that that old one-off birds and the bees conversation that I talked about earlier is kind of an outdated idea, born of a generation where probably any talk about sex was deemed inappropriate or immoral and should just be got over as soon as possible. We simply have to accept that now it's about an ongoing conversation with our children because what if we look back and think, well, I didn't get that quite right or I could have put that better? We don't have to put pressure on ourselves to get it right because guess what? You know, we're in relationship with each other and so we get to kind of go back and have a second go or a 20th go. So we do need to persevere, however awkward it might be. I feel uncomfortable too because I know they're uncomfortable. So it's like, you know, this big circle of uncomfortableness. <laughs> <laughs> the, the circle of uncomfortableness that needs to be breached from time to time to yes. just get a few things out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe our discomfort could even be part of the conversation. Say to your child, you know, I don't really feel comfortable talking about this stuff, but you're that important to me, and, and how you're doing life is that important to me, that either I'm going to find this stuff out, or we can talk about where you might want to, you know, get this information from that feels okay for you. Then if we're able to communicate, this is really awkward, isn't it? You know, then in fact we're kind of naming the feeling that they might be having. You know, and we're giving them permission to make mistakes. And, and, you know, ideally we want to set up a home environment where kids feel it's okay to make mistakes. Because this is not the kind of issue where you want to drop the ball. Parenting isn't supposed to be easy. And this is one of those aspects of parenting, like probably sleepless nights and dealing with tantrums, that in fact is hard. And if we shy away from it, we're actually not doing our kids justice. We actually need to go towards it and have awkward conversations and we can kind of work it out together. And that's the show. Are We There Yet? is produced and presented by me, Katie Gossett, Alex Harmer is the studio operator, and Tim Watkin is our executive producer. The archival audio comes from Nga Taonga Sound and Vision in Archives New Zealand. If you enjoyed it and you want to hear more, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or you can go to our podcast page at rnz.co.nz and you'll find lots of other useful podcasts like RNZ's new Storytime, which has loads of great tales to help kids while away the hours. They can search by title, author, listening age or topic. So head over to storytime.rnz.co.nz. And let us know what you think of it. This has been the last episode in the current season of Are We There Yet? But keep an ear out. We will be back later in 2019.